monsters have come to represent the face of our fears and have captured our collective imagination since the beginning of time. Like our fears, they come in all shapes and sizes and meet us in our nightmares. They can be physical manifestations of evil, spectral presences that hold secrets to the past, serve as metaphors that reflect our current anxieties, or they can be used as cautionary tales, the consequence of man's meddling with the natural order. Film has been the perfect medium to bring these myths to life and allowed filmmakers the opportunity to explore the darker corners of our minds and to create the iconic representations that we will forever associate with these movie monsters. Welcome to part two of the Terror From Below episode of Movie Monsters. I'm Jeremy, and on episode one, I explored the Jaws franchise in depth. On this episode, we're gonna talk about some of the biggest post-Jaws imitators before wrapping up this segment with the deepest and bluest entry into the genre. As I mentioned in part one of the video, the success of Jaws can't be overstated. Almost immediately, imitators started popping up left and right. Movies like Barracuda, Mako, and our next film, 1977's Orca. Orca is one of those sleazy Italian movies that blatantly rips off successful Hollywood movies. The inception was basically, so what if Jaws, but Killer Whale? Brilliant. Anyways, it, it leans into the Moby Dick angle, with a little Jaws 4 thrown in for good measure. In it, a crew attempt to capture a great white shark for an aquarium, which we all know how well that works out. They find one, and when the encounter nearly turns deadly, one of them is saved by a killer whale who intervenes and fucks that shark up. Turns out, there's a family of whales, and our crazy obsessed Ahab of this story, Captain Nolan, sets his sights on the whales, and then things go very poorly for everyone. There are plenty of bizarre moments in Orca, but one in particular makes the biggest splash. Our titular killer whale's quest for retribution begins as it watches in horror, while its mate is harpooned through the dorsal fin, caught, brought up onto the ship, and ends up dying, and then it ends up miscarrying, and they kick the dead fetus overboard, causing the male orca to, understandably, lose his shit. That was upsetting. All these sweet, sweet whales did was try to save that dude from a great white shark, and this is how we repay them? The whole thing is just so outrageous that it ends up being kind of amazing despite itself. It's one of those, like, what were they thinking sort of movies that basically turns our whale into Charles Bronson. That's crazy. Sure, I mean, the sharks and Jaws took out a few boats, even a float plane, but never an entire town. The orcas and orca were brought to life using a mix of real whale footage and animatronic puppetry. And the effects are impressive. I may be so bold to say that the effects in here are better than the ones in Jaws. But, alas, good effects do not a good movie make. For a much scarier and more sympathetic look at this magnificent marine mammal, watch Blackfish. I promise you'll never see Free Willy the same way again. They drew first blood, not me. 1978's Piranha is no masterpiece, but at least it knows what it is. It's a low-budget Jaws parody that was produced by schlockmaster Roger Corman himself. And because you can't go bigger than Great Whites, unless you go Megalodon big, and we're still about 40 years out from that, the filmmakers conjure up a super species of carnivorous fish that finds strength in numbers, not size. Piranhas that were bred to be even more aggressive thanks to an abandoned government experiment known as Operation Razortooth. Joe Dante is one of those filmmakers that's really able to mix elements of horror and humor in almost equal measure, and Piranha served him well as he went on to make hit films such as The Howling and Gremlins. It opens at nighttime as a pair of skinny dipping teens end up being eaten by something unseen, which, yeah, I mean, that's essentially the first scene of Jaws. Afterward, a woman named Maggie is investigating the disappearances when she stumbles upon that research facility, and it's filled with all these genetically altered fish creatures. I feel like that was a missed opportunity, like, why didn't we get a movie full of those guys? Then she inadvertently releases them from the facility and into the river, which, which is, you know, it's not good. And from there, we're off to the races as this super school of fish work their way downstream, munching everyone unfortunate enough to be in their way. The piranhas themselves are actually one of the weaker elements of the movie. I mean, how do you make Brim scary? Turns out the answer isn't a shitload of frantic cuts and editing. 
This is visually unappealing, and you can never really get a good look at the monsters, which is probably for the best. It also renders the POV shots completely hilarious, like this diver. What is he looking at? Like, one piranha? A school of them? I mean, it's gotta be all of them, right? So whose perspective are we looking through? It works better as a comedy than it does a horror movie, despite the fact that it uses many of the same techniques as Jaws did. Speaking of which, 1978 was the same year that Jaws 2 was being released, and the good people over at Universal thought that Piranha was swimming a little too close to their IP, so they tried to have it shelved. Luckily, Spielberg happened to see the movie and he liked it, and his public endorsement was enough to make the studio soften their position. Piranha spawned a sequel called Piranha 2 The Spawning. It's like the first one, only now the killer fish can fly. It's trash, but it did launch the career of real-life Aquaman James Cameron. Also, on the topic of Piranha, there was a remake that was released in the 90s that stars the lady that played Barb in the Night of the Living Dead remake, also from the 90s, and I didn't see it. Maybe I will sometime, but probably not before I finish these videos, because I've already procrastinated enough as it is. 1980s Alligator is another one of those campy B-movies that owes just as much to movies like Them and Attack of the 50-Foot Woman as it does to Jaws. Which, by the way, Jaws owes a lot to those movies too. Anyways, Alligator. After the success of Piranha, Joe Dante was approached to potentially direct this movie, which is about a gator that's been flushed down the toilet as a baby and it's survived off eating genetically modified rats that caused him to grow huge before he eventually breaks free of the sewers and goes on a murder spree. Dante probably passed because, I mean, it's kind of similar to Piranha and he didn't want to get pegged as the guy that only did Jaws knockoffs, I'm guessing. So Alligator was directed by Louis Teague and apparently he directed, oh, Cujo and Cat's Eyes. I bet Mike Flanagan probably loves this guy. Alligator is funny as fuck. Well, let me backtrack a little bit. I don't want to oversell this movie, but it really does have a couple of great moments in it. Check that thing out. The special effects are pretty excellent. Probably one of the best movie monsters of this entire era. Like Bruce, the monster gator named Ramon was sort of a pain in the ass and wasn't all that concerned with the production schedule. He was constantly malfunctioning and breaking down in the middle of the scenes, but despite that after production wrapped, he was given as a gift to the Florida Gators as a team mascot. Ramon made several appearances before games and during halftime shows, and that's about as close to a sports reference as you're going to find on this channel. All right, now we're going to fast forward from Alligator all the way to 1999 to the release of the deepest and bluest entry and the only one to feature a theme song and a performance by LL Cool J. My hat is like a shark, yeah. This is definitely one of those 90s blockbusters that was trying to capitalize on the success of Jurassic Park. I mean, the whole facility disarmed during storm, freeing genetically engineered, highly intelligent super predators that kill and eat those unfortunate enough to be stuck at said facility, teaching the audience that it's best not to play God, may just be a coincidence. In Deep Blue Sea, instead of three highly intelligent super raptors, we have three highly intelligent super mako, with the largest being the ringleader, which the fact that they use another species of shark other than great whites, pretty cool. I mean, mix it up for fuck's sake. Deep Blue Sea has extreme action, elaborate set pieces, huge explosions, an eclectic ensemble of really high quality actors that are portraying stock characters. So basically it's a Roland Emmerich film. But actually, Deep Blue Sea is what you'd expect to get from the guy that was responsible for Die Hard 2, Cliffhanger, A Long Kiss Goodnight, and most importantly in terms of sheer what the fuckery, A Nightmare on Elm Street 4. Because this movie does get weird. Rennie Harlan's direction was seemingly aiming for a Verhoeven-esque tone, and while it's not quite as sharp with the satire, there are a few amazing moments in it. Moments that genuinely surprised me. You know what I mean? Like, look at this shit. That's enough now from all of you. We're going to pull together and we're going to find a way to get out of here. First, we're going to seal off this room. Yeah, not the sort of thing you typically see in blockbusters. The look of the sharks is a seamless blend of animatronics and CGI. You can barely tell which is which. Yeah, the CGI parts are a little stodgy. 
but I will say that it makes the sharks much more threatening when they're articulating and zipping around the frame in a way that we've never seen before. While the VFX ain't gonna blow anybody's minds, the animatronic sharks are actually pretty damn impressive. Sophisticated to the point that they make Bruce from Jaws look like a sock puppet by comparison. As opposed to this, we get this. Coming right at the end of the century, or technically the millennium, Deep Blue Sea set the stage for the toothy terror to come. So make sure that you come back for part three of this video and find out what effect the new millennium will have on the genre. In the meantime, this concludes part two of the underwater terror episode of Movie Monsters. There are plenty of other episodes and there will be more to come, so subscribe if you want to stay up to date with all of the terrible content. Leave suggestions for episodes that you would like to see me discuss on Movie Monsters. Make sure you follow me on social media by checking down in the description where I will provide links. And until next time, I'm Jeremy, this is Movie Monsters, sweet dreams.